Hello everyone, my name is Monica Kretschmer and I'm the founder and CEO of the Universal Women's Network. This is the Peer to Peer Jam and Role Model Talk where we interview our youth and they engage in conversation with their peers. And we also learn from inspiring leaders from diverse industries, sharing their inspiring stories, their career paths, and their leadership wisdom. So today with us is Olivia Deish. It is her very first time moderating the panel, and we have Megan Cotterell joining us. Uh, Kai is going to be part of our jam today. And this is where I say goodbye, and I welcome to the stage Olivia to take over and lead our role model talk. Hello. Today I'll be interviewing Megan Cotterell. Megan Cotterell is an elite martial artist and entrepreneur with a long track record of helping people achieve their goals and dreams in martial arts. Megan has 30 plus years of martial arts experience, holds multiple different black belts, including Taekwondo, Muay Thai, kickboxing, and a fifth degree black belt in Shokutan Karate, as well as a red sash in Kung Fu. Megan is an 11 time world champion and started martial arts at the age of eight. She now owns and operates one of the largest martial arts schools in Canada and has been on Team Canada and coaching Team Canada athletes since 2015. As of 2018, she is president of the Canadian World Kickboxing and Karate Union, for both rings sport and mat sport. Megan is the founder and is currently world president of the Global Women in Martial Arts Initiative, which is made up of 70 countries worldwide. After reading Megan's phenomenal bio, I think it's understandable why she would be today's mentor. With that said, good evening, Megan, and thank you so much for letting me interview you today. Hello, Olivia. Thank you. My first question is, what was the largest hurdle you have found within the sporting world? Okay, well, there's a few things. Um, there was a couple. One was uh, financially. I think that um, I grew up in a very different fashion and there wasn't a lot of extra money for sport. And so that was a huge hurdle when it came to uh, trying to compete, trying to have the money to go compete, um, to have those different opportunities to travel, which I did not have until I was an adult. So that was a huge, um, I would say, challenge that required a lot of adversity. And unfortunately, from the time I was eight up until in my 20s, I didn't have the funds to actually be able to go compete. So I had to put my dreams of being on Team Canada and fighting at the World Championships until I was an adult. Uh, the second hurdle that I found was um, that there wasn't as many opportunities for women in sport. So there was lots more weight classes, a lot more opportunities, um, more events, uh, more, um, I would say, like awareness of men's sports and encouraging that, especially in the martial arts community. So that was a really big uh, challenge and hurdle. And I guess the third thing would be um, Western Canada. Um, there's often a lot more opportunity in the East due to the population. Um, there just seems to be a lot more services, uh, competitions, tournaments, uh, availability to have these opportunities. And so kind of being in the West, being a, a, a girl and then having limited funds would be my three hurdles. No, I completely understand. You know, sometimes in sports, it's not about who's the best. It's about who's got the most money. And when you talk about, you know, elite sports, either in the sense of financial funds or the physical strength required, it goes hand in hand. So throughout all the sports yeah. I've done, I can say that is a very common theme. And most of the time, the sponsorships get given out to the kids who have money instead of the underdogs who need the sponsorships. I agree. I agree. So how long roughly would you say did it take you to overcome that adversity? Because Funds don't over don't appear overnight. Um, my first world championships that I could afford to go to, I was 30 years old. And I so that is yeah. a long time between eight and 30 to be able to afford to work three jobs and be able to train and run a business and save enough money and try to have a couple local businesses help and support me. Um, I think that for Canadian athletes, it's hard because you have to work full time just to, you know, basically have your own day to day 
uh, expenses paid. Plus you have to make that time to train and then you have to raise additional funds just to be able to travel and compete. So it took me a while. No, I don't blame you. Where I work, I've seen that's a common theme with people my age. So that's pretty inspiring. And I'm sure so many athletes can relate. And like you said, you know, young athletes at the age of 15, I've seen drop out because of low funds. And it took you until you were 30. So athletes of young and 21 age can most certainly relate. So to understand more about the field that you work in, because it's not a very common career path. Why did you decide to pursue a teaching role after being a student for so long? Um, I think for me was I sort of wanted to, to do this when I grew up. I just never saw that it was possible. So I didn't have, you know, at the age of eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, like as I moved up, there was no female martial arts instructors. I didn't see anyone at a standalone studio. Like I was taking classes in rec centers and gyms and anywhere where um, I could find martial arts basically, but there wasn't any standalone studios. And if there was, they were very, very small, um, not very kid friendly back in the day. I guess I'm kind of old now. So there wasn't the kids programs as well. And um, there wasn't a diversity of teaching styles. So for me, when I had an opportunity to have my own satellite school at the age of 16, I was able to um, be what I wanted to see in my industry. So I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I knew I wanted it to be physical. I knew I wanted to change lives and empower people and show them what martial arts did for me. Like that made me feel confident, made me feel empowered. I was healthy. It was an outlet. Um, it took me away from, you know, being bullied or having a hard time at home. And so it was kind of my solace and I wanted to create that um, starting at the age of 16 and moving up. And then as I got more experience after 16 and I was able to start, you know, five elements as a standalone business almost 19 years ago, I got to build it into what I wanted to see in the world. Um, not knowing always what that was, except for I built it to, to have this amazing feeling and to have this opportunity for students and to create this opportunity. So for me, it was just, I wanted to build something that had never happened before with what I wished I would have had when I was younger. Yeah, and that's the thing, you know, when you put athletes in a sport at a very young age, the age of eight, nine, and up to 13, they're very moldable. They will look up to you, follow your every move, and really want to please you. So, you know, if there's not that option for young athletes to be there, they're not going to really develop into anything by the time they're 20 and reach their and hit their physical peak. It just doesn't make any sense why it wouldn't be accessible to younger ages or people of every shape and size. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah. How does your choice impact education from other teachers? Because now you have that perspective, it must look different. It does. It's not always met with um, enthusiasm or agreement or support. Um, and so it's, it's a unique position to be in where I get to talk to other instructors, other teachers, other studios, and I get to share what I've learned and how I've been able to grow and evolve, what's made me successful. Um, and also I've been able to, because I've been able to share the feeling that I want to convey and the integrity of the martial arts that I want to teach, I hope that I can take other instructors and their perspective and point of view and allow them to learn in a different way, allow them to teach in a different way, allow them to have another perspective in order for our students to be successful. And in order for students with a lot of diversity to be able to learn in the way that's best for them, not how we feel like they should learn, right? And so I hope that the instructors that I happen to align with, they see the long-term vision and they see the benefits to the students with choosing to have an open mind and a mind that chooses to evolve as opposed to one that's kind of stuck in their own way feels like there's only one right way to do things, uh, doesn't like the idea of cross training or learning from other coaches or bringing in different styles. So I, I hope I'm positive for the ones that want to be here and the ones that want to grow. Fair enough. I mean, sports is, like you said, an outlet outside of school. You know, if I wanted to learn one way and only one way, I would go sit in my classroom for seven more hours, you know? By not having a flexible teaching style, kids just don't want to be there. And that's how it is. And I'm so glad 
that you recognize that so early on. And because you have, you have built practically an empire in the West of Canada for martial arts. So thank you. Because of (laughs) your dedication and your passion towards this, I would like to know your advice on this. To the youth out there who are anxious about testing new waters, what would you say to them about trying anything new? Well, it's a life skill, right? How are you going to evolve into an amazing, passionate, uh, full of life, educated adult if you're not willing to kind of try something new and be brave and take those risks? Like, I feel like even as an adult, I do that every day. Like, I, I try you know, different sports or a different martial art, or I try to learn from a different coach, or I try to do something different in business, or I call on a different mentor to educate me. Um, To the youth, I mean, we want to grow, we want to elevate, we want a more exciting, beautiful, meaningful life. And if you don't take those risks or take those chances, or at least try, you're never going to experience that. Like, what if it's the best thing ever? Like, what if you try one time and it happens to be the best thing ever, and it happens to totally be your thing? how would you know unless you try? Right. And yeah, I guess for the youth, I'd be like, try everything one time, minimum one time, just like food, try food one time. You don't know if you're going to like broccoli until you try it might be awesome. So I would just say, try something once, see if you like it. And then if you just happen to continue to pursue and continue to learn and grow and do new things. And it's something you're going to be forced to realize in school and university and with new jobs and relationships, like take a chance. You know, those chances really are key. And, you know, it doesn't always have to be that something clicks immediately. It might be like, I have this slight curiosity. I might go try it again because I was hesitant to start martial arts. And obviously you saw that being my teacher. But, you know, I followed the pattern rule of math and went over three times. And I was like, wow, this is fun. So it makes sense what you're saying. And I'm sure others will find it extremely helpful. You know, why be scared of something if you haven't tried it? Yeah, could be the best thing ever. So you talked about cross training earlier, right? And what are some skills that kind of transfer between your business side of life and your activity side? Um, like in what way, like in, in a way that they are parallel. Is that what you mean? Like what I've learned, yeah. in business, what I've learned from martial arts. Yeah. So almost like the way you discipline as in mentally, you know, do this X, Y, and Z, or the way you process things when you really don't like sitting at a board meeting, you know, how do you um, get through that? <laughs> for me, I have to admit the biggest parallel is fear. So yeah. I am always nervous and afraid to fight. I have been since I was younger. Uh, and I always force myself to overcome that and face it and go through it. So there's a lot of things in business that are also pretty scary, especially when you're an entrepreneur and, and you're doing things for the first time. So, you know, the first time dealing with lawyers, I was kind of scared. And the first time getting a business license, I was scared. And the first time that I had to like, do my own accounting, I was scared. The first time I had to do my own taxes, I was scared. So literally the same way that you have to face fear in your sport or in your in martial arts for me specifically, um, I push through it. I stay calm. I have a process. I have a structure. Um, I tell myself that anticipation and fear are the exact same feeling because those butterflies are the exact same feeling. And it feels better to know that I can jump in, face the fear head on like a monster, realize it's not such a big monster and then be able to battle the monster. And then I'm on the other side of the bridge, feeling better, big sense of accomplishment. Like growing my business is a huge sense of accomplishment. The way that training for a fight or training for world championships and going and doing my best, like I do in business and then winning that gold medal, like that's huge. But the feelings, the process, the structure, the way I think about it is very, very much the same. And martial arts has made me braver in business and business has made me braver in martial arts. Fair enough. I mean, fears in every aspect of life and the way that you explained it just made a lot of sense. I know I have found a load of mental techniques that have carried over from my schooling to my activity, like skiing or martial arts and those activities to school like you're gonna be here you might as well make the best out of it 
it's one of those things. So what have you found that has helped you gain confidence in those situations? Okay, so honestly, it was repeating. It was doing it over and over and over and over again. It was getting comfortable with the feeling, getting comfortable with taking those risks, getting comfortable with making a plan, getting comfortable with facing the scary thing or the new thing that I didn't think I could do. It was why I competed in so many different events was one of the reasons there was several, but I mean, I wanted to see if I could, you know, win a world medal in Taekwondo. I wanted to see if I could do it in full contact. I wanted to see if I could do it in kickboxing and point fighting and forms and all those kind of things. Um, and so, yeah, like taking those risks, taking those chances, um, proving to myself that I could over and over and over again, it really made the negative self-talk kind of go away. Cause I'm like, well, I felt like this last time and I pushed through and I won a gold medal and I felt like this last time and I was really, really scared. And then I got this huge, awesome contract to help out risk kids. And I was super scared to go talk to the program director or apply for a grant or, you know, facilitate this program, not thinking that maybe I wasn't good enough the same way as maybe I wasn't good enough to go to world championships and win that gold medal. So repeating the process, facing those fears repeatedly helped me to build that confidence. And so I could use it as a tool moving forward. Fair enough. You know, repetition is one of the main learning styles, you know, you see it so often and it's like preparing for an exam just in a different form, right? You know, you sat there, you reread your notes and that isn't enough. So you'll rewrite them 17 times. So yeah. talking about studying of sorts, if you were to have an allotted amount of time to complete any self-development, what would you do? That's such a huge question. I do it all the time. Like, that's why I've been doing Olympic lifting, for example, recently, as I started like Olympic lifting and doing some really heavy lifting is because I was always scared to do that. I never thought I was strong enough. I love reading. I love reading people's biographies where they've had such a big challenge or huge adversity, and they've been able to overcome that huge adversity. So really reading those books and learning about people's life story and what inspired them and what motivated them and what tools that they used in order to, to be better and to grow and to elevate themselves. Um, I, I do think though, that I have a lot of work on the self-development because I have a tendency to work a lot and not take enough time to relax and ground myself and breathe and flow. And so I think if I had a little bit more time, it would be to take a little bit more of a rest and use my creativity a little bit more and, kind of rejuvenate myself because I think I've been going really fast for a long time trying to accomplish goals and grow businesses and learn more things and elevate my own education and so I think some self-development where I had some rest would probably be the best thing. I can agree with you on that one you know every blessing is a curse and success is just one of those things where you're constantly chugging along until you physically need to stop you know you push yourself to breaking point and if you're smart enough to recognize you're there you will back off but sometimes you don't know and you're stuck like me doing rehab for your knee so you know it's very common and this is just one thing that young athletes aren't taught and if they are we ignore it oh yeah that's true yeah adults too adults too so you said you like to read on the side What else do you do that we might not know about? Do you have any secret alias or something like that? Uh, Well, I don't know. Like I do golf. I do golf. So golfing's part of it. Um, I love being in the water. I used to be a competitive and synchronized swimmer. So being in the water. Yeah, I know. I like doing it. Uh, I I went all the way to lifeguarding and I stopped um, to do martial arts and pursue teaching and uh, pursue trying to open up my own school one day. And so I had to make a decision between swimming and martial arts. And I chose martial arts, Um, but I love being in the water. I love swimming. I love water sports. I love being on the boat. Um, That makes me really, really happy. I love hiking and being in the mountains. Uh, Golf is just being outside too. I'm a terrible golfer, but it's been pretty fun. It's been pretty fun learning with my son. Um, Anything I do with my son is amazing. I mean, I'm learning how to play chess, which is brutal. And 
I mean, teaching him how to play crib and doing board games and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, like, I guess just like a lot of reading and fun things like that. So yeah, I guess there, there is an alter ego, but she's also a lot of fun and she enjoys adult concerts and DJ shows and dancing and dancing and dancing for hours. So I would say that's kind of my alter ego. Fair enough. I mean, I'm pretty sure Jennifer Lawrence has one. And by the sounds of it, you guys seem pretty similar in regards to your alter egos. Perfect. Is it by chance named Gail? <laughs> oh my gosh, Gail. That's a, that's a fantastic alter ego. I, I prefer Brenda, but Gail is okay too. Brenda? Solid. Yeah. Feisty. So yeah. Feisty, oh gosh. Um, is there a person that you really like or that inspires you? Um, yes. So my little boy is autistic and he has had to overcome a lot of challenges and watching him be incredibly scared to do absolutely everything in his life. Um, everything from talking to riding his first horse to learning how to play hockey, learning how to skate. Everything was terrifying for him for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks on end. It was super challenging. He's worked so hard his whole life to be a competitive athlete, um, to basically make honor roll in school. Uh, he's made really good friends, but watching his struggles um, has taught me a lot about myself and has taught me a lot of ways that I can better myself. So he's been an amazing um role model for me actually and I've learned a ton from him um there is a lot of people that I admire I would say in business <coughs> excuse me in business and in martial arts as well I mean there's some amazing martial arts females out there like Holly Holm and Ronda Rousey and Misha Tate that I think are just these amazing martial arts competitors but I mean I'd look to Olympians too I mean female Olympians have had to overcome a tremendous amount of struggle. Um, I look at people like Gloria Allred, who has fought for women's rights for decades and decades. And people say terrible things about her and judge her like crazy. And she continues to move forward. She doesn't let it rattle her. She continues to fight for those rights and defend people. And I mean, I think that's brilliant. Um, I think there's just, there's so many people in my world that I look up to and that I find fascinating and amazing and inspiring that it's almost too much to totally sort of talk about. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot that inspires me. Fair enough. And I think the comment about Hadrian, I see it with my brother. So, you know, being related to somebody it's almost like having a mirror in certain aspects you know oh you're nervous you'll react this way and you'll see it and it might irritate you but that's because you're like I do that I do that and you know Hadrian I love him he's got the best sense of style I, I love his little fedora he's fantastic and you know I haven't met him since the start but I can see how much progress he's made over the past few years I've been at the dojo and it's really awesome to see. Thank you. Yeah, he's a good boy. You've done an excellent job, I'll tell you that. Thank you. But yeah, so, you know, you've got a lot of passions. You've got that alter ego Brenda and all sorts floating around. <laughs> what have you done with your passion that has made you the happiest? I think that my passion... Um, what I've tried to do is I've tried to create something that I always wanted, especially uh, something I've wanted as a, as a child. Um, and so because I love martial arts so much, I love what it, it did for me. It lo I, I love how it's helped me grow. It's uh, helped me with my mental health, physical health, spiritual, psychological. It, you know, formed a really amazing community. But I think my the fact that I've created the business that I have through my passion of martial arts, I get to do a lot of outreach into the community. So I get to work with at-risk youth. Um, I get to work with uh, children that have been abused in a variety of different ways. Um, I get to help and support and sponsor uh, low-income children. So the more that I pursue my business and my passion and I grow it and I make it more successful, the more people I can help. And the more I can grow this community and supports for our community. And I think that 
when you have a passion and you're successful, if you don't give back to others, I think you're missing a piece. Fair enough. You know, I said something exactly similar when submitting my nomination package and that has stuck with me funnily enough. You know, I remember sitting there typing it out and you are not succeeding unless the people around you are as well. And that's very important because there's no point pushing people down while you're doing well. It just doesn't help you. It doesn't help them. So help as many people as you can along the way. And it's not like you're doing it for self-driven purposes. It's because it's what feels right. I agree. So yeah. yeah. Now we're going to introduce Kaya Gamble, who is a phenomenal 14-year-old emerging pop singer, songwriter, and multi-instrument based in Calgary, Alberta. Kaya sings in support of charitable causes and has done so at around 40. One of the times she sang for charity was OMGP, Oh My Garden Party, in support of adolescent mental health, as well as a concert with Brett Kissel, a Canadian singer who has made a song Walk Off the Earth at his Christmas party charity concert in support of veterans at the Jack Singer Concert Hall. Her latest, however, is an event called Kaya Live, which was an amazing and all about positivity and spreading love. You can find it on her YouTube channel. Also on YouTube is her first single, Speak Out, and her new song, I'm In It, which is beautiful. I have listened to both songs on Spotify and YouTube. However, they are on every other platform you can think of. Hi, Olivia. Hello. How are you doing? I'm so good. Might I just say you've done an amazing job so far. I, I love it. And Megan, inspiration for real. So amazing. Uh, thank you. I think you girls are on the right track and are very inspiring as well. I mean, I hope I'm on the right track. <laughs> That's all Maybe I you're on the say. right track. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, there's too many <laughs> tracks to choose from. <laughs> you know, in the multiverse of madness that is the universe. There's so many different things. But yeah. Oh, I want to say you did an amazing job. I Before we let Megan go, I just want to say, number one, Olivia, flawless. Like, you have such a gift. You were so natural with your interview today. I wouldn't have been able to tell it was your first time uh, moderating, but you did a beautiful job. I think it probably helps um, that Megan um, has a little bit of a relationship with you. And I just want to say such a role model all over. Uh, Olivia, you were nominated uh, for Women of Inspiration and by Megan. And I just think, yeah. think that circle of reciprocity is so beautiful because what you said, and I wrote this down because I didn't want to forget it, was you will not succeed until everyone succeeds. And I think that the importance of talking about that uh, for young leaders and older leaders, like it, it really has no age to it. It's just so, so relevant to everything that we do. And so I just want to say thank you, Olivia, for really embracing and having the courage, because I imagine you probably had some butterflies today. Um, and I agree, Megan, um, you're, the butterflies for excitement are really, really very much the same as for fear. So I just want to congratulate you both on such a beautiful um, exchange and so much wisdom. Like, I cannot wait to share this. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for joining us here today, Megan. Um, and of course, Kaya, before Megan goes, is there any is there any question that you might have for Megan today before she um, goes to the green room? I did have one quick question. Um, I, first of all, like, your story is amazing. I, I've also done martial arts over the years, ironically, kind of crazy. Um, so how, how we're all connected here. But my big question was, you mentioned that you didn't get a chance to do a world championship until you were 30. How did it feel to finally be on that stage and do what you love for, for the first time after spending so much time working towards that? I was exhausted and terrified, if you are my <laughs> honest opinion. <laughs> I was exhausted and terrified. I was ready. I was ready to do it no matter how old I was. I really feel like it's never too late. And I mean, I've competed heavily all over the world since then. Um, it was just an exciting time. I thought it was the beginning of another journey and a journey that I could work really hard towards. And 
hopefully accomplish all the goals that I wanted. And it was such a, like, it was a super strange goal that I set for myself before I went to the first one. I said, I wanted to win 10 world titles Mm. and I wasn't going to stop until I did. And I won 11. So yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was like an impossible thing, but I, for some reason was like, let's go for it. What do I have to lose? Exactly. And um, one more question. What's your favorite part about being a mom? Oh my gosh. Is that my son is the best thing ever. And he teaches me so much about life. He teaches me to slow down. He teaches me to pay attention. He teaches me to be present and connected. Um, We could not be more opposite in personalities. And so I like opposite, opposite, opposite. Like it's insane. And just the way he sees the world is so incredibly beautiful. And you know, the way that I see his passions come out and the fact that he is such a loving, kind, um, he's all about fairness as well, type of little human. Um, Yeah, it's been really beautiful watching him grow up and I'm excited to see what he's going to do in the world. He is the sweetest. He is the sweetest little boy. (laughs) I know. I think the first, uh, the first year I was at the dojo, I didn't see him much. But then we were there, I think, for a Muay Thai or karate session of a weekend. And we saw him. And my mom was like, oh, as if to say, who is that little kid? And my mom loves kids. And I love kids as well. So, you know, Adrian is just the sweetest little guy that you wish you could put in your pocket. Right. I know. But like, now he's 13. <laughs> but he's not exactly pocket sized anymore. So it doesn't work. No. We'll Still just have to kidnap him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I hope he has a chance to listen to this later so uh, my goal is that we get this recorded out there and then he has an opportunity to see I really really am doing a great job and I'm so proud of my mom Aww. yeah, yeah. Really pretty awesome we should start a Hadrian fan club oh my gosh yes. we, would love that. <laughs> we should He's get like, some branding going somewhere. for him yeah does he I'd buy it yeah. I'd buy it so anyways, thank you so much, Megan. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on board. And of course, you are a woman of inspiration through and through. Um, and we are so glad that you're part of the network and we look forward to having you back. Thank you so much. Great job as well, Monica, as usual, providing these opportunities. So we appreciate it as well. Thank you. And the baton's back with you, Olivia, and all fading to the background. Awesome. So Kaya, um, I have a few questions, right? You have been very successful. You've got so many followers on Instagram. I think, (laughs) was it 49.7K or somewhere around that? I honestly- Should we check? Yeah, I don't really pay attention that much to the numbers, but it's just like somewhat above 40-ish thousand at this point. Oh, I was close. Yeah, I was close. how does that change what you've been posting? Oh yeah, that's a really great question. Um, you know, it was it was kind of a, a crazy journey of how you know it all happened, and, and and kind of a shock as my Instagram just started steadily growing up to this 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 um this following that I'm I'm really I'm really grateful to be able to have found. Um, but I guess what it in terms of how I change how I'm posting, I guess I really want people to get to know me on this platform because what's really amazing about social media and about things like Zoom is you can connect with people where, you know, they don't have to be right in front of you as they can be all over the place. You know, a lot of my following is from Brazil and a lot of it's from the Philippines and all, and all these different places. Um, so I guess the, the, the biggest thing that I really try to do when I'm on social media is uh, use it as a tool for people to get to know me a little bit better and, and get to know my music where otherwise they, they wouldn't have been able to, to hear me to hear me sing and perform. So mostly I just love posting um, any performances, videos of me performing and then um, just, you know, uh, ways for people to get to know me, fun photos and captions and videos and stuff. So yeah, I'd say it hasn't changed much of what I've been posting. Um, it's just kind of changed how I approach it in a way, sort of. <laughs> All right. No, it makes sense. I know that whenever, I mean, I have nowhere near the amount of support. I've got like something like 200. They're sticking. That's strong. amazing. That is still amazing. <laughs> that is 200. They are hauling it through. Um, <laughs> 
and at first what I was posting was things of you know like my dog and this mm. and then I started to apply for grants and scholarships and awards and I was getting high rankings and then it was like I need to tighten this up I need to make this you know and it's funny how Instagram is you only show the highlights of your life very you true only show the highlights so you know the things with the personal aspects for me where, like the dog and what I do in my free time they went away mm-hmm. and now it's more of you know me on the ski hill me do, taking part in fundraisers me I mean they're all very close to my heart but -hmm. they're what people want to see not what I necessarily want to post if that makes any sense no that 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 completely makes sense I totally know what you mean and it's hard to find a balance because I can totally get that as an athlete and you know it's a resume that people come to and they see all your accomplishments um so I've as an artist what I've heard a lot of the time is you know you have to make that resume but also people have to get to know you which is an intricate balance to to try and figure out how do I show people that I'm a professional artist and that I'm taking this seriously even though I'm 15 years old but how do I also show them what kind of person I am and what I do in my day so it's relatable so yeah social media is an interesting thing but it's a tool and and um one that I'm ultimately grateful to have and be connected with these people although it can sometimes be an annoying tool but yes it, it most definitely can be especially when you know you're sat at home and you see a photo of a croissant and you have no croissants in the house so that's an issue that I find <laughs> um I think I mainly have an issue with the food section because I cannot fly to Japan and have some of the greatest ramen in the world which I'm deeply upset about mm-hmm. but I'm sure there's other wants and needs that people see on social media but those are the ones that I see yeah what well, what it is for me is I get all the really sad dog stories about dogs that have <laughs> like abandoned and and are sick and it breaks my heart I literally can't go on Instagram because it's just sad dogs and I'm like no don't don't tempt me with this like why are you showing me these things um but at the end of the day the great thing about that is then they show how they recover and I'm like oh happy ending which is always great but I totally I totally know what you mean about social media it's a it's a complicated thing but can also be used to our advantage in some way yeah fair enough fair enough so where did you when did you decide that you wanted to get into music and was it you know at a karaoke were you just popping on the stage and having the best time ever or were you putting on performances with your cousin to let them sleep over for the night like <laughs> I, was I, there any story I honestly I kind of wish that was the story because mine is a little not as fun as those um my grade four music teacher at school, actually, we were doing some like singing, sight singing, theory exam thing. So I had to sing for the teacher. And then the teacher after school one day came up to my parents and said, did you know Kaya has perfect pitch? She has musical at- at- attributes. And my both of my parents are not musical whatsoever. My dad, he's a helicopter pilot and my mom's an emergency doctor. So they said, no. And she said, what are you doing about it? And they said, you know, she's in your music class. Isn't that enough? And they, um, she was very clear that we, I had to do something else about it. So I started taking piano lessons with her. And after that, I remember hearing Rise Up by Andre Day um, in the background of some store or something. I remember hearing the song and I thought, I really love that song. I'm going to try and sing it. And then once I had it down vocally, I thought, what if I played piano to it? So I listened to the track over and over and I learned the chords by ear and ended up singing and playing that song together. And that's when something really clicked for me. When I was playing piano and singing at the same time, it was this magical, you know, fireworks were going off kind of moment for nine-year-old Kaya. So I decided to start performing and start writing songs and start really diving deep into music and ended up falling in love with it. Um, So that's kind of my story, not as fun as, you know, (laughs) karaoke shows or anything like that. How did you get into, athletics oh um I got into athletics through a variety of ways I mean with my dad's background you know we were a very active family anyway but 
you know, we were Brits, we were new to Canada. So we were like, we'll go skiing. You know, I had skied in Europe in the past. And then, you know, after a season, I had maxed out the level program at about age seven. So I had maxed out level five and the coach turned around and said, she's too young for the adult skiing. She wouldn't enjoy the adult skiing. Put her in racing. So I started out at Nikiska, Nikiska Alpine Ski Association. Phenomenal, phenomenal job that they did at that age. And I had a very devoted coach, Alicia Huduma, who just spent all that time with me to help develop those skills. And, you know, there's very nuanced things like, you know, if you get something wrong with your pitch, you have to repeat it and go back. And it was the same with me. And I was very far behind my peers. These kids had been in racing since they were five. I had joined three years late. I joined in U10+. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having a coach that believed in me helped me get to another um, more competitive club. And that was very self-driven. So mm -hmm. I went to Banff Alpine Races and within two years, I became third in Canada for 2007 girls in 2020 in slalom. Wow. So, yeah. And, you know, there are other things along the way, like a couple other disciplines that I did well in, just not as well. Um, and it just kind of picked up from there. Although I did have a pretty bad crash last season. So I've had to take a break for a little bit. I've damaged my ACL a little bit and I had to, a bad concussion. So, you know, there's pros and cons to this sport and you just kind of got to knuckle down and get through it. So, you know, I've been doing my physio, I've been training on the bike and I've been slowly getting back into that competitive mindset because while recovering and while you're not performing, it yeah. goes do faster, do faster, do better, but you can't, you physically can't. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's well, yeah. kind of an overview. That's amazing. First of all, the fact that you've been able to accomplish so much is phenomenal. I'm really sorry to hear about your injury, but it seems like you're bouncing back with such a positive mindset, which is amazing. You know, like everybody that are those rough times where you're like, mm -hmm. could I have changed this? You know, should I have competed in that race that right. just pushed me over the edge? And it's like, no, I shouldn't have, but I did. Um, but I've taken so much from it, you know. I've learned when to not push something, whether it be in an argument or whether it be, you know, trying to get that extra percentage on an essay, you know, just take it, put it to the side and then build up on it. Yes. Love that. Love that. That's amazing. So yeah, that is, that is fantastic. How did it feel when, how old were you when you moved to Canada? I... Well, I lived in Canada on and off. So I came when I was about five or six. Mm -hmm. We lived here for two years down in a very small village down in Ralston. So 30 minutes from Medicine Hat. Mm -hmm. And then we had to fly back to the UK for eight months. And then I came back and we've been here ever since. So, you know, a total of seven, eight years we've been here. It's amazing. How, what, what did it first feel like to move to Canada? How was that experience for you and your family? It was very overwhelming for little me. I mean, I had just come from Germany at the time. So it wasn't like your typical, you know, move for work. It was like, I always knew I would have to move. But it was a very weird feeling to be like, oh, there's grass because it's in the middle of nowhere. You know, compared to all of the built up cities in Europe that I've lived in, you know, I've lived in Oxford and Sinalaga and places like that just coming to the little little village like little house on the prairie and we're like hmm this seems fun let's move here so yeah that's awesome well that's that's amazing that you guys have been here for this long and have have enjoyed you know a bit of a different a bit of a different lifestyle but also found found it to be good which is which is great yeah it has been and you know there was a point where we were like, oh, we'd never get a dog. You know, we're moving around too much. And we now have a big, chunky boy. We have oh a big... Gosh, what kind of dog? I have a fat Labrador. Fat white lab. Oh, my gosh. That is so sweet. What is their name? Monty. Mont Blanc. Monty. So French for white mountain. 
Oh my gosh, that is the sweetest name ever. And I hear you have a dog. Yes, I know. I'm sorry about that. She is barking like nuts. I don't know what she's barking about. We have a skylight. There's snow on the skylight. She's been freaking out about it all all afternoon. So, but yeah, she is a rescue. Um, but we she, well, we DNA tested her. She's a mastiff lab cross. Um, so yes, very I thought my dog was big. Yeah, yeah your she, dog must be. She's stocky. She's a she's a decent size <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny about dogs, you know. We just casually fat shame them. Whereas if humans, if we were to do that, we'd get in so much trouble. It's so true though. I don't know why. We're just, the dogs, because the dogs, like they, they, all they know is joy. They're just happy all the time. So you say stuff. And I think a lot of the time, I don't think they really understand English. They just hear sounds. So they don't yeah. know. As long as your tone is kind, then. Yeah, they, like they, food they, or yeah, dinner. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I've had a lovely time talking to you and I've really enjoyed talking to Megan. Having you at the end really helped lighten things up because there were some deep questions and I didn't realize is, yes. how deep they were until after, you know, talking to Megan and Megan like, oh, I'm like, oh, maybe next time I'll lighten them up. Have a little more fun <laughs> with this. But yeah, have a good evening, Kaya. Oh, you too, Olivia. This has been so great talking to you. You're amazing. Oh, it has. So are you. Look at you. You're playing all over the place. Are you kidding me? Look at you skiing all over the place. <laughs> I wish I was. All my friends are like in Colorado or Austria at the moment. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. But I mean, you're going to be there one day. You just got a mindset, right? I'm going to be there. Yes. Well, I just want to say listening in the back again, I wish I had the motivation and the vision that I, that you guys have when I was that young to be that clear and purposeful in everything that you do. Like you guys are so inspiring. Um, and I want to say, Kaya, thank you for joining us. Um, Olivia, great job again. And I look forward to the next peer to peer jam and role model talk. And if you know a youth that is, inspiring and wanting to learn and grow, I invite them to be a part of the peer-to-peer -peer jam and role model talk and um, be a part of the conversation. So thanks very much, ladies. Have a great night and we'll see you on the next talk. See ya. Bye.